Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we gather for this time of worship. I pray that you are all safe and well as we join together and giving thanks this year during our Thanksgiving uh, service here at Zion. And so for those uh, who are at home, uh, it is wonderful to have you as well a part of our worship service today. During our service, uh, after John shares his gift of music and our, during our testimonial time, I'm gonna take about a minute uh, and we're just gonna have some silence. And what I'd like you to do is to just think about uh, five things that you are grateful for and that you are thankful for today. And if you wanna write them down or just make kind of a list in your mind. Uh, what I'd also like you to do if, is to think about just sharing that list uh, with somebody else, to share with them what you're grateful for and thankful for this year. As we were talking about in our Bible study this morning, sometimes uh, we forget or don't realize uh, that there is a direct connection between gratitude and trust. Uh, the more that we are grateful for, the more that we trust in God's presence and God's providence uh, in our lives. And when our trust grows deeper, so does our hope. And if we have hope, we can persevere through anything. Amen? <laughs> because we know that God has a wonderful plan uh, to give us a future that is filled with hope. And so we rejoice and we give thanks in that today. Uh, you're also going to have to pray for me because I'm also in charge of the clicker and the screen. And so we'll see if I can do that at, at the same time. Uh, but at this uh, at this point in the service, I'm going to invite you uh, to join with me in our call to worship. And so if you can read in the bold or the yellow that you see on your screen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven. Who knew us and chose us before the world began. Who loves you so much that he calls you his own children. Who has brought us Who has prepared an inheritance for you that will never spoil or fade. Who encourages and strengthens us in every good deed and word. Who comforts you in your troubles so that you can comfort others. This is our God, the ultimate source of all things, and the one through whom we live. Let us worship God together. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to do some music with a couple of friends of mine, <coughs> uh, Bill and, and Gene Canfield, and I got a lot of songs from that couple, and this is one of them. It's simply, thank you. Thank you for giving me the morning.
Hey, John, you know what? Thank you <laughs> for your gift of music. Um, I have a couple of things, Pastor. If, yes. Um, well, that song just about covers, covers it all, it, a lot of it. Um, but I am grateful for the opportunity to still be up here and do this. And uh, I'm not as young as I used to be. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm thankful for that. I feel it's a blessing to be able to, uh, to take part in the services and, uh, and, do, and do my music. And also very grateful for family. Um, my uh, daughters are watching over me pretty good, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I'm thankful that we can still come into this building and, and worship. I remember, uh, it's been a few years ago, Thanksgiving was a big church day. And uh, farmers and small business in these small towns, they, they fill this thing up on Christmas Day. So, um, with that, I'll pass it on to somebody else. Yeah, well, thank you. And I am not only grateful for you, John, but I find you very inspirational, as do all of us. And, uh, and so thank you for the rest who are sharing their gift of music today and, and helping out. It's just a wonderful community of faith. And just, I mean, we can be really thankful for our congregation and, and everyone who's a part of it. It's a, a great blessing. So, um, legend has it that many, many years ago, uh, we'll be reflecting on a very special group of people that uh, when they would celebrate Thanksgiving, they would put five uh, kernels of corn on a plate and to think about five things each year that they were grateful for. So, I'm going to give you just a, a minute and again, uh, just think of those things that you're grateful for. You can either jot them down or again. Uh, just uh, keep them uh, on the forefront of your mind. You know, God is still opening doors for me. Um, I was just thinking of that a couple of days ago. Um, I got introduced to Pastor's daughter, and uh, we were able to do music last Sunday together. And to me, that's a, a door that God has opened again. Um, He's never, never true opening doors. So I, I jump at every opportunity I can get, so thank you, Pastor. Were you all able to come up with a few things that you're grateful for this year? And John, I'm grateful also that you have this uh, connection and relationship with Emily now because uh, she'll call me like three times a day for stuff. And I'm like, you know, why don't you call John, Emily? So, <laughs> so that'll be exciting to see how that friendship blossoms. So. Well, let's take a, a moment now to, to be in prayer, and I'll invite you to, to read with me this responsive prayer that we have in our bulletin and on the screen. Holy One, you who created the heavens and the earth, the snails and gazelle, the dandelion and rose, inchworms and kittens and heirloom tomatoes and kites and ocean waves and all the hues of the color blue, we are grateful. Grateful that we have any sense of your mysterious presence, 
grateful that you give us life and ask simply that we live abundantly and fully into your calling to be your love in this world. Even so, we know that instead of loving recklessly and wastefully, we live hedging our bets and on the safe side. But we care, O oh God, we do care. And so we pray for those who suffer, for those who are sick, for those who are lost, for your dear earth that gasps for help, for your dear innocence, who are targets of random violence and war and neglect. <laughs> Help us remember that we are your beloved children and that we live in your beloved world and that we are alive and can experience life. Bring your healing and love in the corners and streets and spaces in which we live and move and have our being. We pray in the name of our maker, our savior, and our friend. Amen. And now our first reading comes from Deuteronomy, and God is speaking to the people of Israel as they're about to enter into the, the land that God has promised to them. And he reminds them to never forget that all that they have comes from the hand of the Lord. And so here's what God speaks to us today. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valley and hills a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commandments, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied, well, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dread, deadful, dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you, you may say to yourself, my power and my strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Here ends our reading.
Thank you, Randy. Our gospel reading this afternoon comes from St. Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria, Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, who saw that he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, praise to you, God. O Christ. The Lord be with you. Be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, in the midst of our busy lives, we hear your invitation to be still. And in the stillness and time of worship, Lord, we turn to you and we give you thanks for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for sending your son to journey and to live among us. We thank you for the gift of your spirit that reminds us that we are never alone, that we are redeemed and for the gift of your love that not only envelops us with your presence, but a love that overflows into the relationships around us. We thank you for this gift of faith, and we pray that in this time of worship that you will quicken our faith and strengthen our resolve to serve you with passion all the days of our life so that your kingdom would come and that you would be glorified in all that we say and in all that we do. In your holy name, amen. When they left the harbor, they were feeling anxious, to be sure. But even more than the anxiety, they were excited. It was almost as if they were living out the pages of scripture in real time. Kind of like the Israelites who were in bondage down in Egypt. They felt the hand of God set them free from the religious persecution that they were experiencing back in England under James I. And like Abraham and Sarah, it was if, as if God was leading them to a new and distant land, to be a light unto the nations, or as Winthrop would later say, a city on a hill. The date was September 20th, 1620. And for the next 66 days, they endured life at sea until they finally made landfall on November 11th. Nobody knew if it was by accident or if it was by design. But they landed 150 miles north of where they had intended, and they were not prepared for the frigid temperatures. Because they arrived so late, and the fact that winter was on at hand, they decided to stay on the Mayflower until spring. And what started out as an exciting journey to the promised land became a nightmare. It became a time of desolation and starvation and illness and death. 
Of the 102 pilgrims who set out on that maiden voyage by the spring, only 50 had survived the winter. And if it were not for the help of a Native American by the name of Squanto, it is very likely that there never would have been a Plymouth colony or the Thanksgiving that we celebrate today. It was interesting that when they came as foreigners and refugees to this strained land, when Squanto looked upon them, he did not see someone who was other than them, but he saw a fellow human being. He saw people who were in need. And moved by compassion, he gave them seeds and he taught them how to grow corn. He also taught them how to live off the land and he introduced them to the other indigenous tribes who would befriend them and support them. By November of 1621, those early pilgrims were not only surviving, but they were thriving. And it was out of that suffering that a deep sense of gratitude began to well up inside of them and they wanted to share their blessings with their Native American brothers and sisters whom they saw as angels, as messengers sent from God to help them on their journey. It was said that the first Thanksgiving lasted three days and the pilgrim were joined by over a hundred members of the, oh, here we go, Wampanoab tribe. <laughs> and together for three days, they hunted together, they prepared food together, and they ate and played games together. Doesn't that sound awesome? A three-day Thanksgiving feast? You know, I have to tell you, as a side note, I ordered an exercise bike. And so it just came today, so I'm excited to put it together. But they have this chart that shows, you know, how far you have to pedal to burn off a certain amount of calories. And so I figured out that tomorrow I'm going to eat between 12 and 1 p.m. But in order to burn it off, I have to bike until 7 p.m. <laughs> so I can't imagine... <laughs> eating and all these festivities for three days, but it is such a powerful and it is such a wonderful vision for us. It is also said that those first pilgrims, as legend would have it, when they were gathering around the table, set out a separate plate. And on that separate plate, they put five kernels of corn. And that each kernel of corn would help them to remember just like God was speaking through Moses to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy, because they knew how easy it was to forget once things became better, <laughs> once things settled in, that all that we have and all that we are comes from the hand of God. And so as we reflect on those five kernels, five things that maybe we can be grateful for, I'd like to pause on them and just go a little bit deeper today. Well, that first kernel that they had on the plate, it reminds us of the autumn beauty all around us and that everything belongs to God. And there's a wonderful Bible passage from Psalm 24, a song and a prayer of David. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. And this was so important for those pilgrims and those early settlers, but because it reminded them day in and day out that God was the creator and they were the creature and that they had a responsibility to take care of everything that God entrusted into them. And so each and every day they tried to live into a mindset, not so much of ownership, but a mindset of stewardship and servant leadership. And that's such an important thing for us to remember. As they went around the, the plate, there was a second kernel. And the second kernel reminds us of God's love and care for us. And again, in the Psalms, there's this wonderful promise of our Lord. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. 
Your righteousness is like the mighty oceans. Your justice like the ocean depths. Your care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds its shelter in the shadow of your wings. Isn't that just a beautiful prayer? And unfortunately for us, a lot of times, the pilgrims understood, a lot of times we become aware of that during those dark valley times, those times of suffering. But the pilgrims wanted to be reminded of that each and every day, even in the good times, that we have this amazing God who is not only the living God, but this God is faithful, that this God follows through on everything that he promises. And he promises to be there for us and to care for us. And we rejoice and give thanks in that. As they go around the plate, there is a third kernel. And the third kernel reminds us of our love for one another and that we have a social covenant with each other. You know, it was only nine years later that John Winthrop sailed uh, to the Americas. And aboard the Arab, the Arabella, before he let those settlers set one foot on dry land, he preached a sermon to them. We know it as a city on a hill. And it's a servant of brotherly and sisterly love. And he said, before you set foot on this land, you need to understand that we are making a social compact with one another, that we are our brother and our sister's keeper, <laughs> this day and every day. And they were reminded of that on how uh, Squanto and the others cared for them. And so there's this powerful passage from 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. For no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Wow. What powerful words. And then as we go around the plate, there's a fourth kernel. And the fourth, fourth kernel reminds us of our friends, especially our Indian brothers and sisters. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And of course, the question that Jesus put to that one would-be follower and to us is, who is your neighbor? And it goes back to who God is, that God is not only the creator of all things, but we are all children of God. Everyone is our neighbor. The question is, do we choose to see them as such? And what does it mean again, to live into that commandment of Jesus Christ. And then finally, the fifth kernel reminds us that we are free people, but we are not to abuse it. And so Paul says to the people in Galatians chapter 5, for you who were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence but through love become slaves to one another. It was interesting, back in the 1830s through the 1850s, there was a French philosopher who came to the United States by the name of Alex de Tocqueville, and he wanted to study this new phenomenon called democracy. And so he wrote this book. It's about this thick. It's called Democracy in America, and I think it should be required reading of all people. <laughs> and... What de Tocqueville discovered, as he said, the greatest strength and the greatest weakness of America is freedom. <laughs> because he says the danger in America, as Paul warns, is that people will use their freedom to indulge themselves. And he called it uh, the pursuit of, of their own interests. And he says the more we abuse our freedom, the more we become uh, self-centered, the more we start pursuing our own well-being. What he warned is that not only will our lives go astray, but our institutions, he said, will become despotic and we'll lose the freedom that we cherish so much. 
And so again, as Paul is reminding us, God has given us this freedom in Christ, and God has given us freedom to live and move. But the question then becomes, how do we live into that freedom? What do we do with that freedom? And it's such a powerful statement that he says, but through love, we become slave, we become servants to one another. And so our goal in life is not what I can get out of it, but how can I help you to live into your giftedness? How can I help you to fulfill God's calling in your life? And there's a wonderful passage in Philippians chapter 2 that we've been looking at in our Bible study. And you can go back and read that for yourself. And so when we live into these truths, when we live into these five kernels of these things that we are grateful, it's transformational for us in our individual lives. It's transformational for us as a community of faith. And we truly are then a city on a hill and our light does shine for others around us. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing with me our hymn of the day. Praise to the Lord Almighty. 858, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Now please join with me in our litany of thanksgiving. We praise and thank our God for all that we have been given. We praise and thank our God for the earth and oceans, rain and sun, for food and homes. We praise and thank our God for the blessings of life and faith and hope. We praise and thank our God for the Creator who made us, for Christ who saved us, and the Counselor who guides us. We praise and thank our God for family and friends, for neighbors and co-workers. We praise and thank our God, for God has blessed us beyond all expectations. We praise and thank our God for all the blessings which compel us to reach out to those with less, to be of service to any in need, to keep company with the unwelcome, to seek peace and make friends of our enemies. Let us pray. Lord God, you have enriched us, saved us, loved us. Open our hearts and minds to your will, that we may be free to share everything we have, 
to give away whatever holds us hostage in spirit, that we may always know that possessions are just that, things lovely to have, but in the end only good for the good that they can do in this world. Keep us always in that work, the work of Christ and Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of God. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving this year. God bless you. Amen.
turkey holics.